Um, and uh, and uh, in this approach, we try to understand how a bunch of neurons can be put together into a circuit that can carry out a certain a certain function that a um, a, a certain function that we are interested in. And uh, today I'll be talking about the second approach. And uh, mostly following the uh, following my pre following my previous lecture of the um, uh, of the uh, DDM models, I will first introduce the uh, introduce the attractor networks. Um, so what is an attractor model? Um, I think many of you are are already quite familiar with the concept. So basically, in so basically in this kind of neural networks, um, the neurons would tend to would tend to settle down into a stable state. Their their firing rates will go into a stable state, and these stable states um, can be used for decision making. So if we plot if we draw the uh, draw the neural draw the neural network states as the network state space, we can we can um, we we can picture those stable states as the um, as the lowest point in the network state space and. Uh, and uh, if the initial state of the model is somewhere else, it would uh, um, it would be driven by the network dynamics and uh, fall into one of the stable states or the or the attractors. And uh, and uh, again, I will be talking about how we can use this model um, to model the random dot task, as I previously introduced. So the work I uh, so the work I'm going to introduce uh, um, is based on Xiaojing Wang's paper in 2002, and uh, and uh, in this attractor network, there are um, there are two groups of neurons. One group um, includes all the all the excitatory neurons. Uh, which I labeled as A and B here. So, um, so group A and group B neurons receive two inputs, and uh, and the, within this group, uh, there are uh, there are excitatory connections between them. Um, so here we consider two kinds of excitatory connections. One is mediated by AMPA, when it, and the, the other one is mediated by NMDA. And the, the reason we want to, um, and the, the reason we want to uh, emphasize the difference between these two types of excitatory uh, inputs are, um, they have very different dynamics. So on the right, I'm plotting the EPSP, which is the current induced by the uh, 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 by uh, by a synaptic uh, input mediated by different um, uh, channels. So if you look at the AMPA channel, which is the green curve here, you can see a very fast rise phase and also fast decay phase. So that means the AMPA channel has a very fast dynamics. But on the other hand, the NMDA channel has a slow rise, rising phase and a very long, very long decay phase, very long decay time constant. So overall, when you, when you put these two together, which is the black curve here, you get a fast rising phase and a slow decay phase. And the later on, I will uh, tell you the significance of this difference. 
Um, so in addition to the uh, uh, so in addition to the excitatory neurons, we also have the inhibitory neurons, which receive the excitatory inputs from the uh, from the excitatory neurons and the send back send back uh, send back inhibitory connections uh, via the GABA channel. So essentially, uh, the A and B neurons are two group neurons that are competing against each other. Within group A, the neurons are more strongly connected, indicated by um, a larger weight W plus. And the same thing is true for the neurons within group B. Um, but between the group A, B, uh, and also the N neurons, um, the connections are weaker. Um, so, um, so with this setting, we can we can write down um, the differential equations for this neural network. And basically, the neurons are just uh, how can we close the top window? Is it possible to close that? Well, it's all right. So. Uh, uh, so basically, we are model the neuron as um, um, as the standard Beaky integrate uh, units, and uh, the basic function is, is just uh, the change of the voltage uh, depends on both the leaky current and the, the synaptic input. Uh, in addition, uh, for the exciting neurons. Uh, there are uh, so the, the synaptic input um, have four parts, which are uh, the uh, which are the excitatory inputs mediated by the amplifier channel, and uh, so uh, so these are basically just the inputs uh, to the network, and also the Recurrent connection mediated by MPA and NMDA channels, and, and lastly, lastly we have, and lastly we have the recurrent input mediated by GABA channels. And for the input, this is very straightforward. So, uh, so we have the conductance for. Uh, for the input amper channel and the uh, and the voltage difference here here the s term is the proportion of channel that are um, um, that are open at the moment and for the recurrent amper channel we can write down the similar equation but um, but here we have the w term um, which describes the connections between um, the units within the network. And, uh, and uh, for all the Ampere channel, uh, uh, their states can be described uh, by, another, uh, by another equation. So basically the time constant tau for the Ampere uh, should be short comparing to the NMDA channels. And uh, um, so that's about the Ampere channel currents. For, for, the, uh, for the NMDA channel, the equation is a little more complicated because, uh, because uh, in addition to voltage, NMDA channel is also sensitive um, to the concentration of the magnesium. So, um, so we have to include. Uh, so we have to include this term to reflect that, uh, to reflect that fact. And uh, and uh, as you can see, the voltage has to rise enough uh, for this term to be small enough, um, right? So, um, so you have to. Uh, 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 so you have to have both um, um, 
a particular concentration of magnesium and 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 enough of excitation um, uh, to have enough NMDA um, response. And because NMDA channel also have a slow rise, slow rising phase and a slow decay phase, so we have to use uh, two separate equations to describe the rising phase and decay phase of the NMDA channel. And the, in the end, the GABA channel equations are, um, are relatively straightforward. So here, all these sets of equations basically just describe how neurons are wired together. And the dynamics of this equation um, are mostly due to the F term, which are the proportion of channels that are opened um, at moment T. Um, right. So, okay. So based on these equations, we can, um, we can run the simulation and see how the network works. And not surprisingly, the network can perform the task very well. So here you can see that for both the reaction time version of the task and the fixed duration version of the task, uh, the network has a very nice psychom psychometric curve. Um, so the proportion of correct depends on uh, the coherence of uh, the input. And in addition, the network also shows us a nice reaction time um, curve. So the network is faster when the, when the motion is strong and weaker when the motion is uh, weak. And the, we can look at the behavior of the neurons in the network. So here, I'm just showing you two example neurons from the group A and group B. And you can see when the motion strength is really high, if, if the neurons that receive a strong input, um, if we look at the neuron that re receives the stronger input, you can see a very fast rising phase. But, uh, but the other group of neurons shows very weak response. If the motion is weaker, you can see a slower rising phase and, uh, and even slower for the 0% case. If we plot the firing rate for these two neurons, you can see they, um, um, uh, you can use this choice. Um, uh, uh, you can use this choice as the dynamics of a decision-making process. So here, the green and blue are two, uh, uh, two example trials in which the model choose A and B. And you can see in the case when the model chooses A, um, initially it starts from um, a place very close to zero and, uh, and the trace just goes to the right side of the figure. The firing rate for the A neurons increase a lot while the firing rate for the B neurons stays pretty low and uh, the network eventually choose choice A. And the same thing is true for choice B. So based on this uh, kind of analysis, we can do even more quantitative analysis to figure out how this kind of a track network works. So in a, so in a later paper, uh, they use a reduced model um, so that they can uh, so, so that they can compute analytically what happens during the decision making process in the model. And, uh, in, and in the reduced model, they only have two neurons. So here, S1, S2, you can consider this as, uh, uh, as a quantity that's, uh, uh, that's related to the response of these two units. Um, so, uh, so, so the plot is very much, uh, uh, so the plot is very much similar to the plot I just showed you. Um, basically showing you what happens, uh, uh, um, uh, basically showing what are the two neurons' responses 
uh, when the when the model is making decision. And uh, here uh, we uh, and here we plot two lines on which uh, ds2 over dt equals zero and the ds1 over dt equals zero. So uh, so the cross point between the two lines are the stable points in this decision phase. Um, if if uh, and and uh, and uh, in other words, these are the attractors um, of this network. And uh, in the very beginning, if there are no stimulus and the initial state of the network is here, because at this point, both DS2 over DT and DS1 over DT is zero. So the network is not going anywhere. And, uh, and this is a stable point of the network. But once there is an input coming in, <coughs> uh, even if the input has the zero coherence, um, it still changes uh, the landscape of this network state space so that the DS2 over DT, uh, so, so that the DS2 over DT curve is lifted a little upwards and the same thing is true for the DS1 over DT. And now you can see um, the stable point on the left figure disappeared. So, so initially the network uh, is at this state, but now it's no longer at a, a, a stable point. It has to drift somewhere. And in addition, if you look at this diagonal line, it indicates the gradient of the uh, of the network, which means overall um, the network should be sliding toward these directions. But also because this is like a, because this is like a saddle point, it's not a stable point here. So so, so the network cannot stay on the diagonal forever, it will slowly drift toward either left or the right directions. And, uh, and because the network has a lot of noise, it may, it may drift toward either left or right uh, with equal probabilities. So the network's decision eventually will be evenly distributed between left and right. And, uh, and, uh, and that explains the network behavior when the input is at zero. Um, and we can also redraw the network state in one dimension to illustrate what the network does. So initially, when there's no stimulus, the network is staying in a stable point in the middle. And then when, uh, when the input arrives, um, the stable point in the middle disappears. So now the network has to go either left or right. And uh, once the network settles down into one of the attractors, even if you remove the uh, input, the network will stay at that position um, and, uh, and, uh, and remember its decision. Sure. Oh, so so here input are just basically currents proportional to the coherence of the motion. Yeah, so oh, so in their model they just use constant input, right? Right. So so I forgot to mention in their original paper, the input is constant and the, all the noise they uh, all the noise is internal. Okay. So that was the case when the input has zero coherence. What happens when the input is biased toward one of the directions? So here, when we have a input that's biased, but still weak, we can see that we can see that the where's the mouse point? Okay, yeah. So so uh, so we can see that 
uh, uh, the part of the plane that's corresponding to the correct choice um, gets larger a little bit, and the parts of the face plane that's corresponding to the wrong choice is now smaller. So that when the initial uh, when the network starts to drift away from the initial position, it's more likely to go into the correct plane rather than the error plane. But the networks still have two stable points. So, um, um, so, um, so that the network is still uh, capable of making both choices. Um, and, and that's pretty much true. Uh, even for stronger inputs, like like when the coherence is at fifty one point two, but if we increase the coherence to a very large value, we found that um, in this case, one of the one of the attractor did uh, what disappears. So uh, so in this example, there's no longer an attractor here, and uh, and the and the network would drift. Uh, uh, to this, uh, to this attractor, with a probability of one hundred percent. So, with this phase analysis, we can see that. Another question here. Yeah. So, when the coherence is one hundred percent, can we understand it as uh, all neurons are receiving exactly the same input? No, no, no. So, so, so I was saying that the two inputs are proportional to the strength of the motion. So, for example, if it's one hundred percent, input one will be very large, input two will be weak. Okay. Um, if it's zero percent, both input one and input two are weak, right? So, in either case, uh. Group A neurons only receive input one, and group B neurons only receive uh, input two, and uh, it's a competition between these two group of neurons. So, uh, so the competition is implemented by the inhibitory neurons. They they receive common inputs from group A and group B, uh, and uh, and the same back inhibitions. And uh, you can imagine uh, if group A neurons receive stronger input. It would uh, be less inhibited by the inhibitory neuron uh, comparing to group B. So, so, uh, so through these inhibitory uh, inputs, the group A's uh, uh, the group A neurons activity would would goes higher and higher, but uh, but uh, but uh, but eventually. Because the excitatory recurrent connections also have a time constant here, it wouldn't go up infinitely. It will, it will, it will saturate at a certain point, and uh, and that's when the network settles into the uh, into one of uh, the attractors. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. I just want to know how the model doing this decision. Yes. According to what? So the basic idea is because the models have um, two attractors and uh, uh, two network states, and uh, and you can use network states as the uh, um, um, as the decision uh, state. If the network goes into one net, one net, one net tractor, you say then the model chooses choice A. Okay. So you means that it's more like the firing rate of some neurons. Right, right, exactly. So the network states is is determined by the firing rate of these neurons, right? So here, basically, um, when the network settles into this attractor. The firing rate for the B group neurons are large. Firing rate for the A group neurons are small. Thanks. Yeah. So, 
so uh, so this is very like LIP neurons. Uh, when the LIP neurons, uh, when the LIP neurons firing rate reaches uh, a certain threshold, um, a choice is being made. Okay. So, so basically, this is um, uh, the idea of how to use uh, how to use attractor networks to model decision making. Um, and the, and the, the work I introduced uh, was developed uh, uh, like twenty years ago. A lot of progress has been made ever since, uh, with, which can be used for even more complicated, uh, more 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 complicated cases. But the basic idea is the same. Uh, uh, in this kind of network, you use attractors um, to model the process how how the brain settles down into one of the state versus the other, which can um, we, which is when um, the model makes choices. Okay. Any question? From the Barzil side. Okay, if there are no more questions, I have one, which is a second point. <laughs> and uh, and the, this is uh, the practice I would like you guys to do. Basically, um, uh, if you have time, you can write uh, write some code to simulate the model that I just introduced and uh, and you can try the uh, try the SDTT uh, to see how um, um, how well uh, the signal detection theory can tell you about the neuron in the attractor network okay okay so so far um, including the lectures I gave last time, we've talked about the perceptual decision making, right? So in perceptual decision making, we make decisions based on some, um, based on some sensory inputs. And, uh, and, the, and the, there is a ground truth, what should be correct and the, what should be wrong in this kind of, uh, in, in this kind of problem. But, uh, but in the real life situations, not all of our decisions are perceptual decisions. In fact, I would, e I would even argue that um, perceptual decision um, making in its most strict sense actually, actually does not exist in real world. Let's take a look at this example. So I guess, so I guess most people in Beijing already knows this story, but I think as part of the international course, I would like to share this. Uh, I would like to share this little historical story with uh, with Basel. <laughs> um, so, so the story is called "指路 um, which means pointing to a deer for a horse. And uh, and and that story happened uh, in roughly two thousand years ago, when um, when this guy uh, <laughs> wait where is my mouse pointer yeah so um, his name is Zhao Gao and uh, and he was a very powerful person um, at that time he's like the prime minister of the um, of the dynasty, and uh, and he's also very evil. He, uh, he has his eyes on the throne, and but 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 he wasn't very sure that how um, uh, that how much support uh, he had among the generals and ministers in the empire. Um, so one day, in front of the emperor. Zhao Gao brought a deer and said, um, uh, um, and, uh, and said, uh, and said to the emperor that, that he's giving emperor a, a very nice horse as a present. And, and, and the emperor uh, 
um, was very surprised, and uh, and uh, and uh, he thought Chao Gao must be crazy or something. That, um, um, but uh, but uh, then Chao Gao said, "This is indeed a horse. Uh, if you don't believe me, can you ask the other generals and ministers?" And uh, you can imagine what the other people are thinking at this situation. On one hand, you have the emperor, which you are supposed to be loyal to, but you also know the emperor is young, inexperienced, and weak. Um, and the emperor does not have much power at that moment. And on the other hand, you have a very powerful, mean, evil guy <laughs> saying something that's ridiculous. What would you say? Is this a deer or a horse? Right. So, so apparently this is not a perceptual problem anymore, right? Um, you have to consider um, both the fact, the perceptual fact, and uh, and also your moral standard, and uh, and also the outcome of your decision. In the matter of fact, most people who said this is a horse at the moment were killed later by Zhao Gao because he. Um, he really wants to, to uh, only keep the people um, he trusts around, right? So, um, so in the real world situation, the perceptual decisions are always associated with certain value. So, if you want to, so if you want to develop a develop a decision making model, you always want to consider not only just the sensory inputs, but also the outcome, the value, and, and maybe some other, uh, and maybe some other factors into your equation. And, uh, and, the, and the, the, this is the model I want to introduce. So, so, when we are making decision makings, um, it's it's always about um, learning the contingency between stimulus response and outcome, right? If you receive some stimulus, you want to know um, uh, what kind of response will lead to what kind of outcome. Then you can make your uh, then you can make your decisions accordingly. It, uh, in a task. As simple as a Pavlovian, all you need to know is the contingency between a stimulus and outcome. If it's an instrumental task, you need to figure out the contingency between a response and outcome. In the more in a more complex task like um, the delay response task, you need to first uh, consider the stimulus, then after a while make a response then receive the reward or the penalty as the outcome. Or more, or more complicated case, the match to example case, you need to look at two stimuli before you make a response. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, in my last lecture, I showed you an example in which the monkey has used many, many stimuli before they can make a response. But in any case, you could consider the decision making as a problem to solve a sequence of events, and uh, and on the timeline, there is a stream of the sensory events, reward events, and action events. And uh, in the most general case, the action events could depend on the previous sensory events and the reward events and the other action events also, and the. And every time you make a decision, you need to consider many previous events, what's happening, uh, what has happened before, what will happen in the future. It's a sequence of events you need to learn. Um, if we can label these events as letters, actually we can consider this is like a language of nature, like, uh, like each event is a letter and uh, here, the event include both the sense, uh, include sensory events, action events, and reward events. And uh, and when and and when certain events always happen together, uh, 
as a complex event, you can consider this is a war, right? And uh, in the end, you could consider um, uh, the complicated event contingency as the grammar of this language of the nature. And, the, and once you learn this grammar, you should be able to solve the decision-making problem uh, in general. And that's our idea. We, we, uh, we want to test a recurrent neural network which can learn the sequence. Um, then we use this network to test on a bunch of decision-making problems to see how this network performs, if the neurons in the network are like the real neurons in the brain. Um, so the network we choose is called GRU network. That, that, that particular network has been used in many, uh, many natural language processing models. So, um, so we are borrowing idea from the AI field because as I said, the sequence of, the, um, sequence of events is, uh, can be considered as a language and the, and the GRU network is, uh, is useful in processing sequence because it has a structure that's convenient um, for memory. So here I would describe the GRU unit very briefly. Um, so, um, so in the GRU network, each unit has a structure like this. It has an input XT. And uh, it also maintains a state as H. So, um, so the previous state H T minus one goes in through here, and uh, the current input X T comes in here, and they are combined as a weighted average to determine the output of the unit, which is also the uh, which is also the state of the unit at the next time step. So. Uh, so this is the question. Uh, so this is the equation of the final input. HT is a, uh, is a weighted average of the HT minus one and, and HT uh, prime. And the weight is determined by this ZT, which is controlled by what we call the update gate. And, and the update gate is, um, is again, um, the uh, is again a sigmoid function based on the input xt and uh, and the previous state ht minus one, and uh, the w and u are two sets of weights that should be trained, and uh, and I haven't mentioned ht prime yet. ht prime is basically uh, also um, an average between xt and uh, and and uh, and uh, and ht minus one. Here, here the previous state is filtered by rt, which is a reset gate. So, uh, so if you consider ht minus one as a memory, and the and the and the reset uh, gate basically just control how much memory should uh, how much memory should go into the future state. So, um, so the reset gate is also controlled by the input and the previous state with a set of weights that can be trained. And, uh, and our model is like this. So we have a bunch of recurrent units. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, the gated unit connected to each other. And, the, and we feed a sequence of events to this unit. And uh, so because we want to feed all events into a unit, we will have the separate sensory channel, the action channel, and the reward channel uh, as the input channels to, to the model. Each channel is, uh, uh, each channel is, uh, 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 each channel is like, uh, a temporal sequence. Uh, whenever something happens, um, the uh, um, uh, the corresponding channel will have a positive value here. And uh, and we train the network to predict 
the future state. So here, the output of the network is like the identity copy of the inputs so that, uh, so that we want to match the output of the uh, network to the input of the network at the next um, time point. Because the sequence uh, can have infinite lengths, but, uh, but uh, when we are training the model, we will only uh, feed a lens uh, of feed sequences with fixed lens into the model. So what we do here is whenever I see a reward event, I will go back uh, a period of time and, uh, and, uh, and feed uh, the sequence only within this time period into the model. Okay, so the idea is that whenever I receive, a, whenever an animal or the person receives the reward, that is the time you should pay attention to. You, you should remember what happens. Wait, what happened to my screen? Yeah, you should remember what happens before you receive the reward and, uh, and, uh, and to try to learn what are the sequences, what are the events that lead to the reward, right? And, uh, and that's a go up the, um, and that's a go up the network. And by training the model to predict future events, we can use these outputs uh, for different purposes. So for example, the outputs for the sensor events can be considered as a form of predict coding, right? So, um, so people in the field um, have proposed the theory of predictive coding as a model to explain our sensory system, which is basically says our sensory system should contain the prediction of, um, of what the sensory input should be. And, and this model can provide this predictive coding signal. And the action event, the prediction of the action event is basically just the decision making we want, right? We, we, uh, we, uh, what are the actions we want to make in the future? And the prediction of the reward, of course, is just the reward prediction. If you want to use this to calculate reward prediction error, uh, so on and so forth, that, uh, that output can be used for this purpose. Okay. So let's see how this model works. And uh, copy of the previous events, right? So what is the prediction? It's a prediction to the future as well. So no, I said the output is a prediction of future. It, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, so the number of outputs is exactly the same as the number of inputs. They match, but the output is the next time uh, oh, do you train the network at the very beginning? So, yes. Um, so, um, I will tell you how I train the network in a little bit uh, with this example. Okay, so here, uh, it's basically the, the same experiment that I introduced last time. Uh, the monkey uses a sequence of shapes to make a decision, but, uh, but in this particular experiment, it's a re uh, it's a reaction time version, um, so that the monkey can choose how many shades it wants to see before a decision is being made. Okay, um, but the logic behind it is the same. Each shape represents certain log likelihood ratio, and the monkey should accumulate log likelihood ratio to a certain threshold before a decision is made. And uh, and uh, in this 2015 paper, we showed that that's indeed what monkey did in this experiment. Okay, so the model for this experiment is just like this. We have a bunch of inputs out uh, and, uh, and the inputs can be divided into three categories, the sensory action and reward, as I told you before. So here, because a task has, um, so, so here I include the, all the visual uh, components of the task, including sh like shape one, shape two, all the way to shape 10, they're totally 
10 possible shapes in this test and the left target, right target, and the fixation point. Uh, so the input is like this. Uh, whenever, for example, if shape one appears at this moment, this will be a step function um, for the period that the shape one is on the screen. For the period that the right target is, is on the screen, that's also a step function, so on and so forth. And we also have the action input, which is like what the monkey's action is currently. So the actions include the fixation on the fixation point, the fixation on the left target, on the right target, and the fixation somewhere else. Okay, and these are also step functions. And uh, and finally, we have the reward input, which just indicates whether the monkey is getting a reward or getting a no reward, a penalty. And the output is, uh, and the output matches the input. Exactly, but the idea is that the output should predict what happens uh, next for the uh, input. So the loss function of the network is basically uh, is basically this equation. Uh, the output t is compared against the input t plus one. Right. Okay. So uh, so this is very straightforward. There's no trick here. But the training process, I think it's uh, um, it's uh, it's 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 important to mention that um, we are not using a well the uh, where the training process is not exactly supervised training. In the idea is that we are not telling the model how to solve the task. Instead, uh, in the training data. The actions are all random, so um, so of course we are generating the sequence of shapes with the same logic as our design, like uh, like what's the what's the probability of this circle appears within this sequence if the red target is a correct target, so on and so forth, right? But the particular choice of the red or the green are all random, so. Um, they say it's just like when the monkey is not trained at all, it just makes random guesses. Um, of course, the reward uh, is given according to the logic of the task. If the monkey happens to be correct, we will give, well, if the model happens to be correct, we would give the model reward. If the model happens to be wrong, we wouldn't give um, the model reward, so on and so forth. Um, so the idea is that we, oh, we want to mimic the actual training process of the monkeys. We start from the very beginning of with one shape, two shape, three shape. Um, then, then we train the network gradually. And uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I would only feed the sequence which leads to reward to the net uh, to the network. Right. So, so by doing this trick. Essentially, I'm saying that um, the model monitors the sequence uh, for rewards. The the uh, the rewards is like the signal when I should choose uh, a certain sequence to learn. Okay. So, as you might have guessed, uh, the model works, right? <laughs> um, so here on the left is a psychometric curve. You can see when the total log length likelihood is large uh, for the left target. The probability of choosing the left target is very high, vice versa. And also, if we look at the reaction time, which is, um, which is the, uh, well, so, uh, so here I'm plotting two things. One, one is um, uh, the amount of log likelihood ratio is the time of decision. And uh, and these are the green and red traces here, and that means when the monkey, well, so on the x axis is the reaction time, which is the number of shapes that the model sees when the decision is made. So basically, here you can see the model chooses something like a collapsing bound strategy, right? So when the monkey sees more shapes, the total log likelihood ratio at the decision. Um, at the time of decision is smaller. And if we look at the histogram of the number um, of shapes 
it's a time of decision. You can see um, uh, the mode is around three or four. So, so that means the model is most likely to make a decision after seeing three or four shades, but that can extend all the way to 14 or 15 shades. And we can also use logistic regression to figure out how model learns each individual shapes. So here on the left, I plot the, uh, the coefficients from the logistic model versus the, uh, uh, the true log likelihood ratio um, that we assigned to each shape. And you can see the model um, can learn the true log likelihood ratio really well. And uh, if you look at and if we look at the sequence inside, uh, uh, if we look at the shapes inside the sequence, you can see um, again, um, again with the logistic regression model, uh, you can see the early shapes, the first, second, third shapes have roughly the same effect on choice comparing to the the last shapes, right? So the n minus two and minus one shape. And, uh, and that is to say the model almost perfectly integrate the shapes log likelihood ratio together for its decision. And so the model behaves at the monkey. The next question is whether the neurons in the model, whether the units in the model behave at the neurons in the monkey. And, uh, and here is a plot from the original monkey paper to show that how LIP neurons uh, how, how LIP neurons accumulate information. And, uh, and uh, you can see after each shape, the first, second, third shape, um, the neurons firing rate encodes a log likelihood ratio uh, of the, uh, uh, it encodes a total log, total log likelihood ratio at each epoch. Um, so, so you can see when the log likelihood ratio is larger, the neurons response increase faster. When the log likelihood ratio is weak, the neurons response stays the same or even decreases a little. And uh, it's a time of it's a time of uh, the decision. No, no matter how uh, how large initially the log likelihood ratio is. Uh, the activity of this LRP neuron seem to reach to a threshold in the end. Okay. So that's the real neurons. And, uh, in, and the neurons in our network seems to, uh, seems to behave very similarly. So you can see after the first, third, second, uh, first, second, third shapes, you can see the separation of the traces by the, by the total by the total log likelihood ratio. And uh, by the end, when a decision is made, the trees merge, uh, uh, the trees merge together. Uh, okay, so. So, uh, Sir Ian, or do you have neurons that encode uh, stimulus and you have neurons encode um, log likelihood, right? In this GRU network. Right, so, uh, so we have, input neurons, right? So input neurons tell you whether certain shape is on or not. And, uh, and, uh, and within the network, we found LIP-like neurons that's accumulating information during decision-making. And, uh, and re remember the training process um, uh, has nothing to do um, with how uh, we do not tell the model how to solve the test. How we train them, uh, train the network is just to predict what happens next, right? You saw the loss function. Uh, we are training the network to learn the sequence, but, uh, but the network seems to carry out a computation very similar to, uh, to what we saw in the IP. But 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 uh but you didn't train the monkey to do the same task as the network. You didn't train the monkey uh learn the next the uh, next uh next right. time yeah right next time yeah. 
Right. We train the monkey to learn the test by giving monkey reward when the monkey is making the right response, right? Uh, at least that's what we think we are training monkey to do. Uh, the network, we are training the network to make, uh, to make prediction. And, uh, and that turns out to be enough for the network to reproduce the monkey's behavior. Yeah, mm. maybe let me finish introducing this model before we can, uh, we can, uh, we can further discuss the complex, um, further discuss uh, the model. So as I mentioned, the, uh, we have three groups of output of the neurons. And uh, and uh, and the, the action group uh, carries out the decision making, and uh, we also have the sensory group of output, which I uh, mentioned. They might be used for for predictive coding, and uh, we also see some evidence here. So in this particular task, task um, we assign each shape with a log likelihood ratio, uh, which are basically just conditional probabilities. Uh, that means each shape should have different probabilities um, um, when the red target is the correct target and when the green target is the correct target, right? So, uh, um, so these are the actual probabilities that we use in this test. And you can see for the, less, uh, for the left five shapes, they have slightly larger uh, uh, well, they have larger probabilities when the green target is correct than when the red target is co correct. That means that these five shapes have um, uh, have a likely uh, have a likelihood ratio in favor of the green target. Uh, and on the right, we uh, we have five shapes that have um, the probability of appearing when the red target is the correct target, vice versa. And we found that during decision making, the output of the sensory uh, channels actually would reflect uh, the probability on the left. And, uh, and the, you can imagine that when the network is very sure about the log likelihood ratio, uh, I mean, if the, uh, if the network is very sure about the correct answer, Let's say if the correct answer is green, okay, and uh, and the log likelihood ratio is large in this case, you 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 can see the whole distribution shifts to a right. That means um, that in this case, well, so here on the y-axis we are plotting um, the uh, um, the output of the ten shape channels of this network, and. Uh, and uh, and when the and when the network has uh, has already accumulated enough uh, enough evidence for the green target, the whole distribution shifts to a left, um, meaning that the network is predicting that those green shapes are more likely to happen next, right? So. So the network already knows what should be expected if the network has already accumulated a lot of evidence. If the network is not very sure, like the total log likelihood ratio is very small, you can see the whole distribution is shifted toward the center. So, um, so that's more like the average of these two distributions. Uh, that means when the network does not know the correct answer yet, the prediction of the next shape is also not very good. Okay, right. Okay, so, so far we have seen that by training network to learn sequences, we can train the network to do really complicated decision making. Uh, they can learn the association between arbitrary shapes with, uh, with reward. They can use, uh, um, a DDM-like strategy to solve the uh, to solve the task, and 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 not only to this, we found our network can do other things as well. So, for example, we can train our network to do multi-model integration. And so, 
Uh, so I think you probably have uh, um, learned from previous lecture, uh, like what Manish has talked about, how to combine um, uh, how to combine information from two sources to um, um, to make optimal decision making. Here in here in this two thousand eight papers, they train monkey um, to do. Um, uh, to do a task uh, which uses both the vestibular, uh, which uses both the vestibular signal because the monkey is sitting on a motion platform that can move, and also the visual signal, and uh, and the and the two signal would tell monkey which direction the monkey is moving, and the monkey has to tell us whether it's moving to a left or right, right. So basically. Basically, the monkey relies on the vestibular input and the visual input to do the task. And based on the optimal inference, the combined, so the, uh, so the uh, combined information should have a distribution which has the mean, uh, which has the mean between the means of the two source information and the combined uh, and, uh, and the and the standard deviation of the combined distribution should have a relationship uh, at this. And, uh, and this is the theoretical prediction. And they tested monkey and they found indeed when the monkey is doing uh, the task based on the combined information, uh, they showed a much sharper psychometric curve, which means the monkey's choice has a smaller, smaller stand deviation as predicted. If they calculate the threshold of their performance, it, it's very close to the theoretical predictions and the threshold is much lower than, uh, uh, than their performance when they only rely on one of the modalities. And we train, the, uh, and, and we train our network to do this task. Uh, and we found something very similar. So when we are training the model, actually, um, so so the model has two channels of input, right? One um, uh, one channel is visual input, and the other channel is vestibular, and the other channel is vestibular input. And when we are training the model, we 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 only use uh, the uh, we we only use the union model inputs. Okay, we only tested the bimodal inputs condition after the models are trained. And, and nevertheless, we found that the, uh, we found the network learned to combine these two inputs according to uh, the optimal inference. And you can see here, uh, uh, the orange line is the theoretical prediction and the blue line is the network's behavior. You can see they match very well. Okay, so, so the model seems to be able to do something like optimal inference. And finally, even more interestingly, we found that by training the model to learn the sequence, we can actually train the model to show um, um, uh, to show some adaptive behavior, which is unpredicted, uh, well, which is not, uh, which is not expected uh, before. Here, um, we are testing the model with this, uh, we, uh, we, uh, with this task that has been used in many, um, many human studies, and uh, and the, and recently people have uh, started to try this. Uh, in animal studies as well. So in this two-step test, it's like this. Uh, in the beginning of each trial, um, the subjects are asked to make choice between A1 and A2, okay. And, uh, and after they made their choice, they are shown um, two intermediate pictures, B1 and B2. And the probability of which picture are shown is fixed so that uh, B, uh, so that B one is more likely to be shown after A one choice and B two is more likely to be shown after A two choice, 
and uh, and the lastly, there would be reward following B1 and B2 pictures. But uh, the probability of receiving or not receiving reward would change trial by trial. Okay. And uh, and the, the subjects have to figure out which choice would um, more likely lead to reward just based on this feedback. So the question is, how should I um, uh, learn based on feedback? One possibility is that I don't consider the intermediate pictures at all. I would only consider my choice and the reward outcome. And, uh, and uh, as a standard instrument, uh, as a standard instrumental learning indicates that you should always repeat the action that leads to reward, right? So in this case, no matter what happens here, which is now ignored by the subject, if you receive the reward, you would always choose the action that leads to the reward. And that's exactly what the plot says here. No matter what happens uh, here, if you are rewarded, you are more likely to repeat your choice. If you are unrewarded, uh, you are less likely to repeat your choice. But that's actually not the ideal thing to do. If you consider the intermediate states, like mm, let's say you first choose A1, then I showed you B2, then, um, then you get rewarded, okay. So A1, B2 rewarded, what should be your reasoning? You know that uh, B2 is actually unlikely to, uh, to follow A1. This is a rare case. What's more likely is that uh, A2 should lead to B2, right? So if B2 is now being rewarded and uh, I want to see B2 again in the future, I should actually choose a2 right so the uh, so the key uh, so the key here is that the probability at this level is fixed and the probability at this level um, is not so you should always adjust uh, your action based on whether b1 or b2 is is now associated with reward right so uh, so if you see an intermediate outcome which is common, then, then the reward event uh, associated with the common intermediate outcome should be treated just as before. But if you happen to receive an intermediate outcome, which is rare, then you should switch actually what you would do with uh, the common um, state. So this is exactly what you can see here. When you, whenever you see a reward and the intermediate state is a common state, you should repeat your choice. But uh, if the intermediate state is a rare state, you should switch your choice and vice versa. If you do not receive a reward, you actually want to keep your choice if the intermediate state is rare. Okay, any questions? So this is a key to understand this behavior task. And, uh, and we train the task just as before. So whenever, yeah, so we have a very long sequence of events. Whenever the network receives a reward, I will actually feed two trials into the model so that the, so that the model can learn to associate the previous actions, previous events with the current action. And we found the model can learn the task after training. So remember that we are training the model with all these sequences, right? And after the training, the model is now fixed. There is no new learning in the model. And, the, and the nevertheless, we will test the model with, um, with the reversal situation in which the reward uh, associated with B1 and B2 are reversed. And you can see that now the model actually, uh, even with fixed uh, weights and connections, the model learns 
the reversal very well. Um, so, so before the reversal, the model performs almost 90% correct. After, what in, uh, after reversal, initially the model is terrible, but gradually the model learns uh, the new contingency and the, and the performance recovers. And, uh, and uh, if we plot how model treats the reward and uh, non-reward events, we can see uh, the exact behavior, as I explained before, uh, the model learned to use the intermediate states to do the test. Um, so as I mentioned, we only um, feed two trials uh, into the model, but we found that actually the model would remember uh, trials even, uh, even further back into the history. So here we use the logistic regression just to see uh, whether uh, the last trial or the last uh, or, um, or the or the last two trials or um, or the third last trial would affect the model's performance. And and indeed, uh, here we can see as long as the five trials back can affect the model's performance. And finally. As I mentioned, not only the model carries out uh, the action events for its decision, it also computes uh, the predicted reward. And, the, and we can use standard uh, Q-learning model um, um, to calculate the Q value um, in this task. And we found the model's prediction, uh, reward prediction matches the Q value uh, matches the reinforcement learning model very well. Okay, so so here comes to the thinking point, right? So uh, so I so I've talked about this model that learns sequence and performs uh, performs several tasks. Uh, in the first task. Uh, the model learns a sequence, uh, but behaves as an uh, behaves as an evidence accumulation uh, decision maker. Uh, and and the, in the third task, uh, we found that model, once trained with its fixed weights and everything, can learn um, the new reward contingencies. So I would like you guys to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to think about this, why the model works for this kind of uh, test when there's no new learning at all in the model. And uh, any idea why it works? And the and yeah, does we that have mean a, that we have adaptive behavior? We have someone that uh, wants to offer her. Okay. Yeah, because because the the, the regularity in the world changed, right? Because you versed uh, right. everything, and by by detecting such change in the regularity, um, the network will det will detect it and transmit such change of regularity in the latent state of the neural firing. Thus, it it behaves that. As if it's learning, um, it's learning after the reverse. Yeah, uh, I think you're getting it. <laughs> um, well, um, maybe I could rephrase your answer as this. So, um, so the so the recurrent network has a memory, right? It remembers what happens in the past, and. Uh, and with that memory, you, you can actually, um, you can you you can you can actually decide what to do in the future. So, uh, so essentially, you might think that the network is just doing this. What happens in the past, uh, in in the recent history? Uh, what's the more rewarded choice in the recent history? And uh, that information alone should be enough for this kind of decision making task, right? So, so, 
Oh, there's model a... structure, structure capture structure in the natural world. So that's the answer to the question, or it's a question itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think what what he's trying to he or she is oh, answer to the question. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, well, the model structure captures the structure in the test, right? That's exactly right. So, yeah. So that's very good. That's very good. Uh, so I think the point of this uh, uh, question is that um, we have been talking about reinforcement learning. We have been talking about a lot of uh, value-based decision-making questions, right? Um, and uh, but uh, but reinforcement learning might not be the only model that can explain animals' adaptive behavior. Mathematically, if you expand reinforcement learning, it's just uh, um, like um, um, decide your action based on uh, what happens in the past, right? Uh, if you have a memory system enough, you don't actually need uh, reinforcement learning to do the task. And uh, in many animal studies, even human studies, actually the task itself is not that complicated. So, uh, so in my words, uh, uh, considering the possibilities that the animals are actually not doing much learning uh, for this kind of simple task, it could be the case the animals just Learns the structure of task and uh, and uh, and uh, rely on its memory to do this adaptive uh, uh, adaptive behavior. Okay, any further questions? Any questions from the audience? Any questions from the Basel side? Let's let's first ask our Basel students. <laughs> so, sorry, I have a question about the uh, uh, common choice and real choice. So actually, it seems like there is a gating control uh, between the common choice strategy and the real choice strategy. Uh, do you have any idea of how the brain implement this gating control, like using your activity or using some specific connectivity structures? Uh, I'm not sure if I get your question. Are you asking okay. what the actual brain does? Yeah, yeah. So actually, there is two different strategies for, for example, A one to B one, and the reward is a common strategy. And there is another strategy is A one to B B two, and the reward is a rare strategy or rare pathway. Right. So it seems like there is a gating control that uh, control the system to switch between these two strategies. So how does the brain to implement this gating control? Using your activity or use some specific attention? Oh, here, well, here, here it's not the brain that, that determines the common or rare. So, uh, so common or rare, Common and rare are just two probabilistic events that happens after you choose A1 or A2. If you choose A1, there's a larger probability B1 would happen and a smaller probability that B2 would happen. They, they, they say it's just the structure of the task. It's, it's not a strategy that the brain uses. It, uh, it's just the structure of the task. And, uh, and, uh, and the subject has no control which which intermediate state uh, they will encounter. Uh, they can only observe uh, whether B1 or B2 uh, would happen. Then, uh, then, uh, uh, then again, the reward will be given based on a probability. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's also part of, this, uh, part of the task that the subject has no control. All the subject uh, 
uh, can choose is just A1 or A2 in the beginning. Right. So, so I might not be clear here. Um, here, the plot on the right only explains what the subject should do uh, after they after they receive the reward or not, and after they after they observe either a common intermediate state or a rare intermediate state. So the idea is that if you see a common intermediate state uh, and uh, and the, and the you're rewarded, you should repeat your choice. If you see a rare intermediate state and you're rewarded, you should actually switch your choice because you know that uh, for the case of rare intermediate, actually it's more likely to be caused by the other choice, right? So imagine if uh, your current choice is A1, you say you you see B2 and the B2 is rewarded and uh, and uh, for you to see B2 again in the future, you should, you should choose A2, right? Am I clear? Okay, I guess you have no more questions. Um, uh, there's another question in the chat room. I noticed that in the paper, the striate and units are further divided into two groups that project to the direct and indirect pathways. What are the considerations behind this design? I oh. guess. Yeah. So, um, so, so, mm, so for this particular task, actually nobody has recorded <laughs> neurons in the brain yet. There, there are a bunch of functional MRI study which indicates the stride and plays a very important role in learning this task. But uh, we know nothing about direct and indirect pathways in, um, from the functional MI studies. Um, but, 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 but I think it's a very interesting idea because the competition between the two pathways probably would help us to learn the task. And, uh, and the basal ganglia obvious with its, um, um, uh, with its dopamine pathways uh, is very important, well, has been proposed to play very important roles in reinforcement learning. So, so a lot of paper is basically trying to use reinforcement learning framework uh, to explain how the brain, how the brain solve this task, right? But our model instead is saying that, well, maybe the brain doesn't solve this task very with reinforcement learning. Um, instead, the brain use memory to, uh, to do this task. And the brain is just trying to map the past memory into future actions. If the past memory tells you more A1 is rewarded, may, maybe I should choose A, uh, A1 more in the past. And, uh, and uh, um, so, um, so the model would predict somewhere in the prefrontal cortex maybe would be more important for this um, task. That's what I would predict. Okay. All right. So, other question? Yeah, uh, this is a very general question. And we know that in reinforcement learning, what the agent want to maximize is the reward, right? Right. And in this, in 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 your model, you assume that the agent or the network receive lots of training. Mm -hmm. But in reality, like for example, in the reinforcement learning task, participants just went to the experiment room and read the instruction, then do the task directly, right? So they don't, um, they as the agent don't have the the chance to train themselves. Yeah. by many many trials so i want uh i don't want i yeah. wonder whether it's that's a very that, that that's a very good question but i think what you uh are referring to 
is a totally different kind of learning because uh, teaching uh, with instructions is, is like the transfer of some concept, the structure of the task through language. That, that's not something we're trying to model here. Imagine if you're training a monkey or a mouse to do this task, you will still need a lot of training to teach the animal the structure of the task, right? Even for human, in the studies in which no instructions are given, they just ask the human subjects to figure out the task structures. You will need a lot of trials for the humans to learn this task. And, uh, and I think this is the kind of learning that we're trying to model here. And uh, I think the important difference between this and the reinforcement learning model is that uh, is the role of reward. So in, in reinforcement learning, every time you receive reward, you calculate reward pre-teaching error, uh, then you propagate the reward pre-teaching error through um, your state. You would update the policy and so on and so forth. Here in our model, reward is like a filter uh, in the training phase. In the training phase, whenever you receive the reward, that maybe would raise your attention. Um, then you use the, uh, your memory to reconstruct what happens before the reward is received. You use that information to train your brain to learn the sequence. And, uh, and we show that with enough, that enough of this training, actually it's already, um, it's already sufficient for the network to show many of the behavior we can see in the animals. And the advantage of this is that, um, yeah, so I forgot to mention, actually the training sequence is again, totally random, right? So, um, so during the training, we, uh, we, we, we do not feed the network what should be uh, chosen. All the choices are totally random. Uh, we would only give the network reward according to the logic of the test. And, uh, and the, the only thing that helps them model to learn is uh, which sequences are actually fed into the model, right? Uh, we only fed into the model the rewarded sequence. Okay, and uh, and uh, that alone we found is sufficient for the model to learn. Okay, uh, how many LIP like neurons in this model, and what's the relation with uh, uh, our connectivity among these neurons? Yeah, the question about connectivity uh, that's a great question. Actually, we did a lot of analysis about the activity in the paper, and uh, and uh, some results are quite interesting. Uh, but I'm not sure if I have enough time to discuss. So, so basically, we found uh, in our model that uh, uh, that there are two uh, there uh, there are two groups of interesting neurons. One group is what we call which neurons which neurons would decide which choice the network would eventually choose, uh, uh, the red target versus the green target. But on the other hand, we also find the when neuron, and the when neurons determines when the network would make the choice. So remember our task is the reaction time task, right? So, uh, so we find the neurons that determines when and the neurons that determines which are two separate groups of neurons. If you, if you do simulated lesion, you can actually manipulate the reaction time without affecting the overall proportion of red or green choice. Or, or you can manipulate in the red and green choice overall um, uh, without changing the reaction time. And we found within each group, uh, they are better connection comparing to the across groups, so on and so forth. But, uh, but, uh, but, um, but I guess in general, if you want to ask uh, the question like, uh, like, is this network an attractive network? Um, uh, we haven't done enough analysis to show um, 
the dynamics of this network enough, but I don't think the network is an attractive network for the reason uh, as follows, because um, uh, because uh, if, um, because an attractive network should settle into a stable um, state when the de when the decision is being formed, right? And the, and the, we didn't find that pattern. So our network could uh, could change its activity pattern quite dramatically. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm curious about an um, uh, interesting thing. So in psychology, uh, there is a phenomenon called the forced memory. So when we uh, when we receive a reward, then we'll we tend to overestimate the probability of rewards uh, relating to this kind of stimuli. So could this model be an explanation of this kind of phenomenon? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, so, so I personally believe, um, <laughs> if you design task and train the train the model to do, the model can do this task. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, so the reality is that the most, uh, most behavior paradigm that uh, we use in experimental works, no matter it's human experiments or animal experiments are quite simple. And, uh, and, uh, and our model with only a small number of neurons can actually solve this kind of simple task is pretty well. Um, so if you want to train the model to learn the task, that should be sufficient. Um, but whether the model would uh, reproduce um, the behavior of animals and humans, that depends on whether the animal and humans, um, well, uh, how well they learn the uh, task, actually. Actually, I, uh, um, I think the model always tries to be optimal. Right, because we uh, uh, we train the model to learn what are the sequence that lead to reward. So in that regard, the model always tries to to be optimal. Um, of, of, of course, we can try different things. Like uh, like we can we can manipulate the length of sequence depending on um, on what happens at the moment of the reward. Maybe we can uh, even try some. Uh, 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 something like exponential decay of memory, things like this. Yeah. Uh, if you we make the model more complicated, uh, the input sequence somewhat uh, mimic the memory of the uh, uh, um, the memory features of humans and animals. Maybe it can reproduce some interesting uh, behavior. Right. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, so by no means my lecture is intended to be a comprehensive review uh, of neural network models of decision-making, uh, but I hope it will be interesting uh, for the students uh, to think about how to apply either a well-structured network like uh, like the attractor network or, or, or how to train your network to do a decision making model but but uh, but in general um, the work with using neural network models to model behavior is not like uh, uh, the neural network uh, work in AI field you have to consider um, how my model could capture uh, the behavior and the neural data how my model would be biologically plausible, things like that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks to Tammy thank again. Thank you much. It's a wonderful talk. So now let's switch to the next session, the life and science discussion session. And we have two speakers here. Um, one is Tiaming. Unfortunately, Hang is not able to come. So instead, one of our organizers sent volunteers to be uh, 
<laughs> attend our life science discussions and share uh, his career path, which is actually quite interesting. So you two please sit down in the front. And we also have uh, a uh, Jonathan will join us on the Basel side. Hello. Um, yeah, hi, Jonathan. Jonathan is joining, is, is, is walking to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we, we so we're waiting for him. Uh, yeah. Jonathan is still uh, oh, switching something? the camera. Um, <laughs> camera, the camera uh, is on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. We're uh, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I don't I, think it will be boring this time. So, so any questions? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Great. Uh, maybe uh, before behind, start, can I just say something? 